This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I tried with it. <laughs> out with it i try to dance back and forth from the deep technical mm -hmm. to the philosophical so i've i've done that quite mm -hmm. a bit so you're a world-class computer scientist and yet you've written about this very point that philosophy is important for experts in uh, any technical discipline though they somehow seem to avoid this so i thought it'd be really interesting to talk to you about this point why should we computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists care about philosophy, do you think? Well, I would reframe the question a little bit. I mean, uh, philosophy almost by definition is uh, the subject that's uh, concerned with the biggest questions that you could possibly ask, right? So, you know, uh, the ones you mentioned, right, are, are we living in a simulation? Uh, uh, you know, are we alone in the universe? How should we even think about such questions? You know, is the future determined? And what, you know, what do we even mean by it being determined? Uh, why are we alive at the time we are and not at some other time? You know, and, and, and uh, you know, when you, when you sort of contemplate the enormity of those questions, I think, you know, you could ask, well, then why, why be concerned with anything else? Right? Why? Uh, why not spend your whole life on those questions? You know, and I think I think in in some sense that is the the right co uh, way to phrase the question, and you know, and 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 actually, you know, what what we learned, you know, I mean, throughout history, but really starting with the scientific revolution with Ga you know Galileo and so on, is that there is a good reason to you know focus on. Uh, narrower questions, you know, more uh, technical, you know, mathematical or empirical questions. And that is that you can actually make progress on them, right? And you can actually uh, often answer them. And sometimes they actually tell you something about the philosophical questions. But sometimes they reframe your whole understanding of them, right? And so, for me, philosophy is just the thing that you have in the background from the very beginning that you want to, uh, you know, you know the, these are these are sort of the reasons why you went into intellectual life in the first place, at least the reasons why I did, right? Uh, uh, but you know, uh, uh, math and science are tools that we have for, you know. Act <laughs> discourse well I'm, I'm not i'm not sure if they do so more than any other scientists do uh, i mean i mean yeah, right. uh i mean i mean i mean alan turing was famously you know interested and in, you know his his uh uh most famous uh one of his two most famous papers was in a philosophy journal mind you know it was the one where he proposed the turing test mm -hmm. uh he uh, uh took uh, wittgenstein's course at cambridge you know argued with him I just recently learned that the little bit, and it's actually fascinating. Mm. Uh, I, I, I was, I was trying to look for resources in uh, trying to understand where the sources of disagreement and debates between Wittgenstein and uh, Turing were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that these two minds have somehow met in the arc of history. Yeah, well, well, well the the transcript, you know, of their uh, 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 the course, which was in 1939. <laughs> Of these these formal systems are just uh, 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 um, a complete irrelevancies, right? If a formal system is irrelevant, who cares? You know, why does that matter in real life, right? And Turing is saying, well, look, you know, if you use an inconsistent formal system to design a bridge, you know, the bridge may may collapse, right? And you know, so so Turing, in some sense, is thinking decades ahead. You know, uh, I think of of where Wittgenstein is to where the formal systems are actually going to be used. You know, in computers, right. right, to actually do things in the world. You know, and 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 it's interesting that Turing actually dropped the course 
halfway through. Why? Because he had to go to Bletchley Park and, you know, work on something of more immediate importance. That's fascinating. <laughs> it yeah. Take a step from philosophy to actual, like the yeah. biggest possible step to actual engineering with yeah. actual real impact. Yeah. And, and, and I, I would say more generally, right, uh, uh, you know, a lot of scientists are, you know, instead uh so i think um you know for uh, 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 for me uh i i enjoy talking about philosophy i even go to philosophy conferences sometimes uh such as the you know fqxi conferences i uh, enjoy interacting with philosophers i would not want to be a professional philosopher because i like being in a field where i feel like you know uh, uh um you know, if if uh, I get too confused about the sort of eternal questions, then I can actually make progress on something. <laughs> can you maybe link yeah. on that for just a little longer? Yeah. What do you think is the difference? So like the corollary of the criticism that I mentioned previously, uh, that why ask the philosophical questions of the mathematician mm. is if you want to ask philosophical questions, then invite a real philosopher on and ask them. So what's the difference between a, the way a computer scientist or mathematician ponders a philosophical question and a philosopher ponders a philosophical question? Well, I mean, I mean, a lot of it just depends on the individual, right? It, it's hard to make generalizations about entire fields, but you know, I think, I think uh, if we, if we, if we tried to, if we tried to stereotype, you know, yes. we would say that, uh, uh, um, you know, a, 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 a uh, scientists very often will be uh, less careful in their use of words. You know, I mean, philosophers are really experts in sort of, you know, like when I, when I, when I talk to them, they will just pounce if I, you know, use the wrong phrase for something. Experts right? you know, is a very nice word. You could say sticklers, <laughs> sticklers. or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or you know, they will they will sort of interrogate my word choices. Yeah. Let's say to a much greater extent than scientists would, right? And uh, and scientists, you know, will uh, often if you ask them about a philosophical problem like the hard problem in, in of consciousness or free will or whatever they will try to relate it back to you know recent research right like, you know ways of trying to approach these questions that you know we don't for which we don't even know really what an answer would look like but uh, uh and yet somehow we can't help but keep returning to the questions and you have a kind of mathematical beautiful mathematical way of discussing this with the idea of q prime oh right you write that usually the only way to make progress on the big questions, like the philo the philosophical questions we're talking about now, is to pick off smaller sub questions. Mm -hmm. Ideally, sub questions that you can attack using math, empirical observation, or both. You define the idea of a Q prime. So, given an un an unanswerable philosophical riddle Q, replace it with a merely in quotes scientific or mathematical question q prime mm -hmm. which captures part of what people have wanted to know when they first asked q yes then with luck one solves q prime so you you describe some examples of such q prime sub questions in uh, your long essay mm -hmm. titled why philosophers should care about computational complexity so you catalog the various Q primes on which you think uh, theoretical computer science has made progress. Can you mention a few favorites, if any pop, if any pop to mind, or the year? Well, yeah. Stuff? So, so I mean, I, I would say some of the most famous examples in history of of that sort of replacement were, you know, I mean, I mean, to to go back to Alan Turing, right? What he did in his. Uh, uh, computing machinery and intelligence paper was exactly, you know, uh, he uh, explicitly started with the question, can machines think? Yep. And then he said, uh, uh, sorry, I think that question is too meaningless. Yeah. But here's a different question. You know, could you program a computer so that you couldn't tell the difference between it and a human, right? And, you so know, he, yeah. So in the very first few sentences, he, in fact, just yep. formulates the Q prime it question. Precise, he does precisely that. Or you know we could look at at at, at Gödel right uh, uh, where you know you, you had these 
uh, philosophers arguing for centuries about the limits of mathematical reasoning, right, and the limits of formal systems. And, um, you know, then by the early 20th century, uh, uh, logicians, you know, starting with, you know, Frege, Russell, and then, you know, most uh, spectacularly Girdle, you know, managed to reframe those questions as, look, we have these formal systems, they have these definite rules. Are there questions that we can phrase within the rules? <laughs> You know, I, I I had this essay called "The Ghost in the Quantum Turing Machine." Mm -hmm. uh, that was, you know, one, one of the crazier things I've written. But I I, uh, I tried to do something, or you know, to to advocate doing something similar there for free will, where you know, instead of talking about is free will you know real, where we get hung up on the meaning of you know. <laughs> Consistently with the laws of physics, could a person's behavior be predicted, you know, without, so let's say, destroying the person's brain, you know, taking it apart in the process of trying to predict them. And, you know, and, and that actually, uh, asking that question gets you into all sorts of meaty and interesting issues, you know, issues of uh, uh, what is the computational substrate of the brain, you know, or uh, uh can you understand the brain, you know, just at the sort of level of the neurons, you know, at sort of the abstraction of a neural network? Or do you need to go deeper to the, you know, uh, molecular level and ultimately even to the quantum level, right? And of course, that would put limits on predictability if, if, if you did. So you need to reduce, you need to reduce the mind to, to a, a computational device like formalize it so then you can make predictions about what you know whether you could predict the behavior. Well, if you system. were trying to predict a person, yeah, then presumably you would need some model of their brain, right? right? And now the question becomes one of how accurate can such a model become? Can you make a model that will be accurate enough to really seriously threaten people's sense of free will? You know, not just metaphysically, but like really, I have written in this envelope what you were going to say next. Yeah. Is you know, accuracy kind of the thing. right yeah. term here? So well, it's it's also a level of abstraction has to be right. So if you're yeah. if you're accurate at the some, somehow at the quantum level, mm -hmm. that may not be convincing to us at the human. <laughs> going to do right i am you know and 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 um you know and and and, and in discussions of free will you know it's, it seems like both sides want to you know very quickly dismiss that question as irrelevant well to me it's totally relevant okay because uh you know if, if someone says oh well you know a, a laplace demon that knew the complete state of the universe uh you know could predict everything you're going to do therefore you don't have free will you know that that it doesn't trouble me that much because well you know I've never met such a demon right <laughs> I you know uh you know and and uh, uh we you know we even have some reasons to think you know maybe it, you know it could not exist as part of our world you know it's only uh, an abstraction a thought experiment on the other hand if someone said well you know I have this brain scanning machine you know you step into it and then you know every paper that you will ever write it will write you know, every thought that you will have, you know, even right now about the machine itself, it will foresee, you know, and well, if, if you can actually demonstrate that, then I think, you know, that, that, you know, that, that sort of threatens my internal sense of having free will mm -hmm. in a much more visceral way, you know, but now you notice that we're asking an, uh, a much more empirical question. We're asking, is such a machine possible or isn't it? We're asking if it's not possible, then what in the laws of physics or what about the behavior of the brain, you know, prevents it from existing? So if you could philosophize a little bit within yeah. this empirical question, at where do you think would enter the, the, by which mechanism would enter the possibility that we can't predict the outcome? So there would be something that would be akin to a free will. Yeah, well... Um, you could say the the sort of obvious possibility, which was you know recognized by uh, Eddington and many others about as soon as quantum mechanics was discovered in the 1920s, uh, was that uh, if um, 
you know, let, let's say a sodium ion channel, you know, in the in the uh, in, in in the brain, right? You know, it, it's it, its behavior is chaotic, right? It it sort of it's governed by these Hodge, uh, Hodgley-Huxkin equations in, in neuroscience, right? Which are differential equations that have a stochastic component, right? Now, where does, you know, and, and this ultimately governs, let's say, whether a neuron will fire or not so fire. Th th that's right? the basic and, chemical process or, or electrical process by which signals are sent in the brain. Exactly, exactly. And, and, uh, you know, and, and so you could ask, well, well, where does the randomness in the process, you know, that, uh, uh, that that neuroscientists or what what neuroscientists would 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 treat as randomness? Where does it come from? You know, ultimately, it's thermal noise, right? Where does thermal noise come from? Well, ultimately, you know, there are some quantum mechanical events at the molecular level that are getting sort of chaotically amplified by you know a sort of butterfly effect, uh, and so uh, you know even if you uh, knew the complete quantum state of someone's brain you know at best you could predict the probabilities that they would do one thing or do another thing right i think that part is actually relatively uncontroversial right the the uh, the controversial question is wh whether any of it matters for the sort of philosophical questions that we care about because you could say if all it's doing is just injecting some randomness into an otherwise completely mechanistic process well then who And, and 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 so on. Yeah, that so somehow on. also takes away the feeling of free will. Exactly. I mean, I mean, to me, it seems essentially just as bad as if uh, the machine deterministically predicted you. It seems, you know, hardly different from that. So, so that, so then, um, uh, uh, but a, a more a more subtle question is: Could you even learn enough about someone's brain to do that? Okay, because you know another central fact about quantum mechanics is that uh, uh, making a measurement on a quantum state is an inherently destructive operation, okay? okay. So, uh, you know, if I want to measure the, you know, position of a particle, right, it was, well, before I measured, it had a superposition over many different positions. As soon as I measure, I localize it, right? So now I know the position, but I've also fundamentally changed the state. And so, so you, you could say, well, maybe in, in trying to build a model of someone's brain that was accurate enough to actually, you know, make, let's say, even, even well-calibrated probabilistic predictions of their future behavior, maybe you would have to make measurements that were just so accurate that you would just fundamentally alter their brain. Okay. Or, yeah. or, 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 or maybe not, maybe you only, you know, you, it would suffice to just make some nano robots that just measured some sort of much larger scale, you know, macroscopic, uh, behavior, like, you know, is, you know, what is this neuron doing? What is that neuron doing? Maybe that would be enough. See, but now, you know, I, 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 what I, what I claim is that we're now asking a question, you know, in which, you know, it is, it is. ultimately like feedback to the hard problem of consciousness yeah. you know and as much as you can try to sort of talk around it or not right and and you know and then and, and there is a, a reason why people try to talk around it which is that you know uh, democritus talked about the hard problem of consciousness you know in 400 bc in terms that would be totally recognizable to us today mm -hmm. Right, and it's really not clear if there's been progress uh, since, or what progress could possibly consist of. Is there a Q prime yeah. type of sub question that could help us get at consciousness? It's something about consciousness. Well, experience. well, I mean, well, I mean, there is the whole question of you know of of AI, right? Of you know, can you build a a, 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 a human level or superhuman level AI, and uh, you know, can it can it work in a completely different? Mm -hmm. Right, it would take place in different terms in such a world, even if we hadn't answered the question. And and my claim about free will would be similar, right? That if there if this prediction machine that I was talking about could actually be built, well, now the entire discussion of the you know of free will is sort of transformed by that. Um, you know, even if in some sense the the metaphysical question hasn't been answered. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It transforms it fundamentally because say that machine does tell you that it can predict perfectly and yet there is this deep experience of free will and then that, yeah. that changes the question completely. Yeah. And it starts actually uh, getting yeah. to the question of uh, the the uh, the AGI, the Turing questions mm -hmm. of the demonstration of free will, the demonstration of intelligence, the demonstration of consciousness, mm -hmm. does that. Well, or, you know, I mean, I mean, the knowledge that this machine had predicted everything I would do, I mean, it might drive me completely insane, right? But at any rate, it would change my experience to, to act, you know, to not just discuss such a machine as a thought experiment, but to actually see it. Yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I mean, you know, you, you could say at that point, you know, you could say, you know, wh wh why not simply call this machine a second instantiation of me and be done with it, right? What we, you know, what, wh wh why even privilege the original me over this perfect duplicate that that exists in the machine? Yeah, or yeah. It, it, there could be a religious experience with it too. Yeah. It's kind of what God throughout the generations <laughs> is supposed to. Have that God kind of represents that perfect machine mm -hmm. is able to, um, I guess, actually, yeah. well, I, I don't even know what are, what are the religious interpretations of free will. <laughs> uh, does, so if God knows perfectly everything in, in religion, mm -hmm. in the various religions, mm -hmm. Where does free will fit into that? Do you know? That, that has been one of the big things that theologians have argued about for thousands of years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am I am not a theologian, yeah. so maybe I shouldn't go there. So there's not yeah. a clear answer in a book like. Uh, I mean, I mean, like, this is you know the Calvinists debated this. The you know this has been you know I mean different re religious movements have taken different positions on that question, but that is how they think about it. You know, meanwhile. You know, a large part of sort of what what animates you know theoretical computer science, you could say, is you know we are asking sort of what are the ultimate limits of you know what you can know or you know calculate or figure out by you know entities that you can actually build in the physical world, right? And uh, if I were trying to explain it to a theologian, maybe I would say, you know, we are studying, you know, to what extent, you know, gods can be made manifest in the physical world. I'm not sure my colleagues would like that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk about quantum computers. For yeah, sure, time. sure. As you've said, quantum mm -hmm. computing, at least in the 1990s, was a profound story at the intersection of computer science, physics, engineering, math, and philosophy. So the, there's this broad and deep aspect to quantum computing that represents mm -hmm. more than just the quantum computer. Yes. But can we start at the very basics? Mm -hmm. What is quantum computing? Yeah. So it's a proposal for a, a new type of computation let's say a new way to harness nature to do computation uh, that is based on the principles of quantum mechanics. Okay, now the principles of quantum mechanics have been in place since 1926. You know, they haven't changed. Uh, you know, what's new is, you know, how we want to use them. Okay, so what does quantum mechanics say about the world? You know, the, the physicists, I think, over the generations, you know, convinced people that that is an unbelievably complicated question and, you right. know, just give up on trying to understand it. Uh, I can let you in, not uh, not being a physicist, I can let you in on a secret, which is that it becomes a lot simpler uh, if you do what we do in quantum information theory and sort of take the physics out of it. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, the way that we think about quantum mechanics is sort of as a generalization of the rules of probability themselves. So, um, you know, you might say there's a, you know, there was a 30% chance that it was going to snow today or something. You would never say that there was a negative 30% chance, right? That would be nonsense. Uh, much less would you say that there was a, you know, an I percent chance, you know, a square root of minus 1% chance. Uh, now, the central discovery that uh, sort of quantum mechanics uh, made is that uh, 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 fundamentally the world is described by uh, uh, um, or you know the, the sort of let's say the possibilities for for you know what a system could be doing 
are uh, described using numbers called amplitudes, okay, which are uh, like probabilities in some ways, but they are not probabilities. They can be positive. For one thing, they can be positive or negative. In fact, they can even be complex numbers. Okay, and if you've heard of a quantum superposition, this just means the uh, some state of affairs where you assign an amplitude, one of these complex numbers, to every possible uh, 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 configuration that you could see a system in on measuring it. So, for example, you might say that uh, an electron has some amplitude for being here and some other amplitude for being there, right? Now, if you look to see where it is, you will localize it, right? You will sort of force the amplitudes to be converted into probabilities. That happens by taking their squared absolute value, okay? And then, and, uh, 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 and then you know, e e you can say either the electron will be here or it will be there. And, you know, knowing the amplitudes, you can predict the pro at least the probabilities that it will, that you'll see each possible outcome, okay? But while a system is isolated from the whole rest of the universe, the rest of its environment, uh, the amplitudes can change in time by rules that are uh, uh, different from the, the the normal rules of probability, and that are you know alien to our everyday experience. So anytime anyone ever tells you anything about the weirdness of the quantum world, you know, or uh, assuming that they're not lying to you, right? They are telling you you know an, yet another consequence of nature being uh, described by these amplitudes. So most famously, what amplitudes can do is that they can interfere with each other, okay? So uh, in the famous double slit experiment, what happens is that you shoot a particle, like an, an electron, let's say, at a screen with two slits in it, and you find that there are, you know, on a second screen, now there are certain places where that electron will never end up, you know, after uh, 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 it passes through the first screen, and yet, if I close off one of the slits, then the electron can appear in that place, okay? Mm -hmm. so, by, so by decreasing the number of paths that the electron could take to get somewhere, you can increase the chance that it gets there, okay? Now, how is that possible? Well, it's because, we, you know, as we would say uh, now, the electron uh, has a superposition state, okay? It has some amplitude for reaching this point by going through the first slit, it has some other amplitude for reaching it by going through the second slit. But now if one amplitude is positive and the other one is negative, then no, you know, I have to add them all up, right? I have to add the amplitudes for every path that the electron could have taken to reach this point. And th those amplitudes, if they're pointing in different directions, they can cancel each other out. Hmm. That would mean the total amplitude is zero and the thing never happens at all. that tries to exploit, you know, these, exactly these phenomena, superposition, amplitudes, and interference in order to solve certain problems much faster than we know how to solve them otherwise. So it's the basic building block of a quantum computer is what we call a quantum bit or a qubit. That just means a bit that has some amplitude for being zero and some other amplitude for being one. So it's a superposition of zero and one states, right? But now the key point is that if I've got, let's say, a thousand qubits, the rules of quantum mechanics are completely unequivocal that I do not just need one amplitude, you know, I don't just need amplitudes for each qubit separately. Okay, in general, I need an amplitude for every possible setting of all thousand of those bits. Okay, so that what that means is two to the one thousand power amplitudes. Okay, if I if I had to write those down, let's or let's say in the memory of a conventional computer, if I had to write down two to the one thousand complex numbers, that would not fit within the entire observable universe. Okay, and yet you know quantum mechanics is unequivocal that if these qubits can all interact with each other, and in some sense I need two to the one thousand parameters, you know, amplitudes to describe what is going on. Now, 
you know, now I can tell you know where all the popular articles you know about quantum computing go off the rails is that they say you know they they sort of sort of say what I just said, and then they say, oh, so the way a quantum computer works is just by trying every possible answer in parallel. You know, <laughs> right? You know, you know that that sounds too good to be true, and unfortunately, it kind of is too good to be true. Uh, the the problem is, I could make a superposition over every possible answer to my problem. You know, even if there are two to the one thousand of them, mm -hmm. right? I can I can easily do that. The trouble is, for a computer to be useful, you've got to, at some point you've got to look at it and see and see an output, mm -hmm. right? And if I just measure a superposition over every possible answer, then the rules of quantum mechanics tell me that all I'll see will be a random answer. You know, if I just and you try to do it so that for each wrong answer, some of the paths leading to that wrong answer have positive amplitudes and others have negative amplitudes. So on the whole, they cancel each other out. Okay, whereas all the paths leading to the right answer should reinforce each other, you know, should have amplitudes pointing the same direction. So the design of algorithms in this space is mm -hmm. the choreography of the interferences. Precisely, that's yeah. precisely what it is. Can we take a brief step back and sure. uh, you mentioned information. Yes. So in which part of this beautiful picture that you've painted mm. is in information contained? Oh, well, information is at the core of everything. That but I mean... But a bit is zero or one. That's, so that's right. That's a basic element. That's right. And what we would say is that the basic unit of quantum information is the qubit, is, you know, the object any object that can be maintained in a, uh, manipulated in a superposition of zero and one states. Uh, now, you know, sometimes people ask, well, but, but, but what is a qubit physically, right? And there are all these different, you know, uh, uh, proposals that are being pursued in parallel for how you implement qubits. There is, you know, superconducting quantum computing that uh, was in the news recently because of Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment, right, where um, um, you would have uh, some little uh, uh, coils where uh, a current can flow through them in two different energy states, one representing a zero, another representing a one. And if you cool these coils to just slightly above absolute zero, like a hundredth of a degree, then they superconduct. And then the current can actually be in a superposition of the two different states. Uh, so that's one kind of qubit. Another kind would be, uh, you know, just a, a, an individual atomic nucleus, mm -hmm. right? It has a spin. It could be spinning clockwise, it could be spinning counterclockwise, or it could be in a superposition of the two spin states. That is another qubit. But see, just like in the classical world, right, you could be a virtuoso programmer without having any idea of what a transistor is, right, or how the bits are physically represented inside the machine, or even that the machine uses electricity, right? You just care about the logic. It's sort of the same with quantum computing, right? Qubits could be realized by many, many different quantum systems, and yet all of those systems will lead to the same logic, you know, the logic of, 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 of qubits and, and how, you know, how you measure them, how you change them over time. And so, you know, the, the subject of, you know, how qubits behave and what you can do with qubits, that is quantum information. So yeah. to, just to linger on that, sure. so, so the, the physical design implementation of a qubit mm -hmm. does not does not interfere with the that next level of abstraction that you can program over it. So it truly well, is the idea of it is is the is it okay? Well, it, to, to, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, today they do interfere with each right. other. That's because the all the quantum computers we can build today are very noisy, right? And so sort of the 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 you know the qubits are very far from 
from perfect. And so the lower level sort of does affect the higher levels and we sort of have to think about all of them at once. Okay, but eventually where we hope to get is to what are called error corrected quantum computers, mm -hmm. where the qubits really do behave like perfect abstract qubits for as long as we want them to. And in that future, you know, the you know, which you know, a future that we can already you know sort of prove theorems about or think about today. But in that future, uh, uh, the the logic of it really does become decoupled from the hardware. So if if noise is currently like the yeah. biggest problem for quantum computing, mm -hmm. and then the dream is uh, error correcting mm -hmm. quantum computers, yes. can you just maybe describe what does it mean for there to be noise in this system? Absolutely. So yeah, so the problem is even a little more specific than noise. So the, the fundamental problem, if you're trying to actually build a quantum computer, you know, of, of, of any appreciable size, is uh, something called decoherence. Okay, and this was recognized from the very beginning, you know, when people first started thinking about this in the 1990s. Now, what decoherence means is sort of the unwanted interaction between you know your qubits, you know the state of your quantum computer and the external environment. Okay, and why is that such a problem? Why I said, talked before about how you know when you measure uh, a quantum system. So let's say if I measure a qubit uh, that's in a superposition of zero and one states to ask it, you know, are you zero or are you one? Well, now I force it to make up its mind, right? And now probabilistically it chooses one or the other. And now, you know, it's no longer a superposition. There's no longer amplitudes. There's just, there's some probability that I get a zero and there's some that I get a one. Um, and uh, now the, 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 the trouble is that it doesn't have to be me who's looking, okay? Or in fact, it doesn't have to be any conscious entity. Uh, uh, any kind of interaction with the external world that leaks out the information about whether this qubit was a zero or a one, sort of that causes the zeroness or the oneness of the qubit to be recorded in you know the radiation in the room in the molecules of the air in the uh, uh wires that are connected to my device any of that uh, uh uh as soon as the information leaks out it is as if that qubit has been measured okay mm -hmm. it is um you know the 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 state has now collapsed uh you know another way to say it is that it's become entangled with its environment okay but you know, from the perspective of someone who's just looking at this qubit, it's, it is as though it has lost its quantum state. And so what this means is that if I want to do a quantum computation, I have to keep the qubits sort of fanatically well isolated from their environment. But then at the same time, they can't be perfectly isolated because I need to tell them what to do. I need to make them interact with each other, mm -hmm. for one thing, and not only that, but in a precisely choreographed way, okay? And, you know, that is such a staggering problem, right? How do I isolate these qubits from the whole universe, but then also tell them exactly what to do? I mean, you know, there were distinguished physicists and computer scientists in the 90s who said this is fundamentally impossible. You know, the laws of physics will just never let you control qubits to the degree of accuracy that you're talking about. Um, now, what changed the views of most of us was a profound discovery in the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, which was called the theory of quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. Okay, and the upshot of that theory is that if I want to build a reliable quantum computer and scale it up to, you know, an arbitrary number of as many qubits as I want, you know, and doing as much on them as I want, um, I do not actually have to get the qubits perfectly isolated from their environment. It is enough to get them really, really, really well isolated. Okay. And even if every qubit is sort of leaking, you know, its state into the environment at some rate, as long as that rate is low enough, okay, I can sort of encode the information that I care about uh, in very clever ways across the collective states of multiple qubits. 
okay, in such a way that even if, you know, a small percentage of my qubits leak, well, I'm constantly monitoring them to see if that leak happened. I can detect it and I can correct qubits that are even more reliable than they are, right? Got so it. The, the error correction becomes a net win rather than a net loss, right? And then once you reach that sort of crossover point, then you know your simulated qubits could in turn simulate qubits that are even more reliable and more. so on until you've just you know effectively you have arbitrarily reliable qubits so long story short we are not at that break even point yet we're a hell of a lot closer than we were when people started doing this in the 90s like orders of magnitude closer but the key ingredient yeah. there is the more qubits the better because uh, ah. Well, the more qubits, the larger the computation you can do, right? I mean, I mean, a, a, a qubits are what constitute the memory of your quantum computer, right? But also for the yeah. uh, sorry for the error correcting mechanism. Ah, uh, yes. So, so, so the the way I would say it is that error correction imposes an overhead in the number of qubits. So, so, you know, there's a lot of work on, you know, inventing better, trying to invent better error correcting codes. Okay. But that is the situation right now. In the meantime, uh, uh, we are now in, um, what, uh, the physicist John Preskill called the noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC era. And this is the era you can think of it as sort of like the vacuum, you know, we're now entering the very early vacuum tube era of quantum yeah. computers. The quantum computer analog of the transistor has not been invented yet, right? That would be like true error correction, right? Where, you know, we are not, or, or, or something else that would achieve the same effect, right? We are not there yet. Uh, and, um, but, but, but where we are now, let's say as of a few months ago, you know, as of Google's announcement of quantum supremacy, you know, we are now finally at the point where even with a non error corrected quantum computer with, you know, these noisy devices, we can do something that is hard for classical computers to simulate. Okay, so we can eke out some advantage. Now, will we in this noisy era be able to do something beyond what a classical computer can do that is also useful to someone. That we still don't know. People are going to be racing over the next decade to try to do that. By people, I mean Google, IBM, um, you know, a bunch of startup companies, or, you know, uh, and research players. Labs. That are, yeah, and, and, and research labs and governments yeah. and uh, yeah. You just so, mentioned a million things. Well, I'll, I'll backtrack for a second. Yeah, sure, ask. sure. Uh, so we're in these vacuum tube days. Yeah, just uh, entering them. And I'm just say. entering. Wow. Okay. So yeah, how do we escape the vacuum? So how do mm -hmm. we get to? Uh, how do we get to where we are now with the CPU? Uh, yeah. Is this a fundamental engineering challenge? Is there, f is there breakthroughs in on the physics side that they're needed on the computer science side? What's or is there an is it a financial issue where a much larger just sheer investment and excitement is needed? Uh, so, so you know the, the, those are excellent questions. Uh, my With guess, no my, 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 well, well, no, no, my 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 guess would be all of the above. Yeah, I mean, my my guess, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, you could say fundamentally it is an engineering issue, right? The theory has been in place since the nineties, you know, at least, you know, uh. uh uh, you know, this is what, you know, error correction, you know, would look like, you know, we, we do not have the hardware that is at that level, but at the same time, you know, so you could just, um, you know, try to power through, you know, maybe even like, you know, if someone spent a trillion dollars on some quantum computing Manhattan project, right, then mm -hmm. conceivably they could just, you know, build a, a an error corrected quantum computer as it was envisioned back in the 90s right i think the more plausible thing to happen is that there will be further theoretical breakthroughs and there will be further insights that will cut down the cost of doing this still alive but okay. he thinks uh, there's still a thousand x improvement just okay. on shrinking the transition that's possible hmm. whatever the point is that the exponential growth we see it is actually 
a huge number of these S curves. Mm -hmm. In the quantum computer space. Okay. All right. There, there, there was a lot there to, to, to uh, but, but just to, to, to uh, break off something. I mean, I think we are in an extremely special period of human history, yeah. right? It, I mean, it's, it is, uh, you could say, obviously special, you know, in, 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 in many ways, right? There are, you know, uh, uh, you know, way more people alive than there, than there, than there have been. And, and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, um, you know the whole you know uh, future of the planet is in is in is in question in a way that it 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 hasn't been you know for for uh, the rest of human history but but uh you know in particular you know we are in, in the era where you know we we finally figured out how to build you know universal uh, uh machines you could say you know the things that we call computers, you know, machines mm -hmm. that you program to uh, uh, simulate the behavior of, of whatever machine you want, and um, you know, and 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 once you've sort of crossed this threshold of universality, you know, you've built, you could say, you know, Turing, you've instantiated Turing machines in the processors you know at least until quantum computing quantum computing is the one thing that changes what i just said right yeah, yeah, but you know in you know, as, as, lo as, lo as long as it's classical computing then it's all questions of numbers and uh uh, uh you know the the you could say at a theoretical level the computers that we have today are, are the same as the ones in the 50s they're just millions of times you know faster and with millions of times more memory and you know i mean i think there's been an immense economic pressure to you know get more and more transistors you know get them smaller and smaller get you know add more and more cores and um you know and 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 in in, in some sense like a huge fraction of sort of all of the technological progress that there is in all of civilization has gotten concentrated just more narrowly into just those problems, right? And so, you know, it has been one of the biggest success stories in the history of technology, right? There's, you know, I mean, it is, I, I am as amazed by it as, as anyone else is, right? But at, at the same time, you know, we also know that it, you know, and I, 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 uh, uh, I really do mean we know that it cannot continue indefinitely, okay? Because you will reach, you know, fundamental limits on, um, you know, how small. You know, in, you know, in, in, in reality, we're going to reach the limits long before that. But, you know, that is a sufficient proof. That, that there's you know, a limit. <laughs> yes, yes. But it would be interesting to try to understand the mechanism, the economic pressure that you said, just like yeah. the um, Cold War was a pressure on getting us, uh, getting us, mm. get because I'm both, my us is both the Soviet Union and mm. the United States, but yeah. getting us, the two countries to get, to hurry up to get the space to the moon, there seems uh -huh. to be that same kind of economic pressure that somehow created a chain of engineering breakthroughs that resulted in yeah. the Moore's law. Yeah, well, it'd be I'm, nice to replicate. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, some people are sort of uh, uh, um, get depressed about the fact that technological progress, you know, may seem to have slowed down in in many many realms outside of computing. Right. right? And there was this whole thing of you know we wanted flying cars and we only got Twitter instead, right? And uh, yeah, Peter, good old Peter Thiel. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So then jumping to another really interesting topic that you mentioned. So Google mm -hmm. announced with their work in uh, the the paper in Nature with Quantum Supreme. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, quantum supremacy is a term that was coined by, again, by John Preskill in uh, 2012. Uh, not not everyone likes the name, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it sort of stuck. Uh, uh, you know, we don't, uh, I don't know, we sort of haven't found a better alternative. It's technically uh, you know, quantum I, computational. Com <laughs> Deutsch, people like that were talking about it in the early 80s. 
and and uh, and and quantum supremacy just refers to sort of the point in history when you can first use a quantum computer to do some well-defined task uh, much faster than any known algorithm running on any of the classical computers that are available. Okay, so uh, you know, notice that I did not say a useful task. Yes. Okay, you know, it could be something completely artificial. But it's important that the task be well defined. So, in other words, you know, there is it, it is something that has right and wrong answers, you know, and th that are knowable independently of this device, right? And we can then, you know, run the device, see if it gets the right answer or not. Can you clarify a yeah. small point? You said much faster than a classical implementation. Yeah. Uh, what about? sort of what about the space with where the class there's no there's not it doesn't even exist a classical algorithm oh, to so 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 maybe i should clarify everything that a quantum computer can do a classical computer can also eventually do okay and the reason why we know that is that uh, uh, a classical computer could always, you know, if it had no limits of time and memory, it could always just store the entire quantum state, you know, of your, you know, of, of the mm -hmm. quantum, or store in a list of all the amplitudes. Exponentially slower. In so, some cases. quantum computers don't go to some magical place outside of Alan Turing's they definition of computation. Precisely. They do not solve the halting problem. Right. They cannot solve anything that is uncomputable in Alan Turing's sense. What they, what we think they do change is what is efficiently computable. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, since the 1960s, you know, the word efficiently, you know, as well has been a central word in computer science, but it's sort of a code word for something technical, which is uh, basically with polynomial scaling, mm -hmm. you know, that as you get to larger and larger inputs, you would like an algorithm that uses an amount of time that scales only like the size of the input raised to some power and not exponentially with the size of the out input, right? So, yeah, so I, I do hope we get to talk again because mm. one of the many topics that there's probably several hours worth of comp conversation mm -hmm. on is complexity, which we yes. probably won't even get a chance to touch <laughs> mm. today. But uh, you briefly mentioned it. Uh -huh. But let's, uh, let's maybe try to continue. So you said uh, the definition of quantum supremacy is basically uh, design is achieving a place where much faster on a formal mm -hmm. that quantum computer is much faster on a formal well-defined problem yes that's not, that is or isn't useful yeah 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 right right and and I, I would say that we really want three things right we want first of all the quantum computer to be much faster just in the literal sense of like number of seconds you know uh it's just solving this you know well-defined you know problem secondly we want it to be sort of uh, uh, you know, for a problem where we really believe that a quantum computer has better scaling behavior, right? So it's not just an incidental, you know, matter of hardware, but it's that, you know, as you went to larger and larger inputs, you know, the classical scaling would be exponential and the scaling for, for the quantum algorithm would only be polynomial. And then thirdly, we want the first thing, the actual observed speed up, to only be explainable in terms of the scaling behavior, right? So, you know, I want, I want, you know, a, a real world, you know, a real problem to get solved, uh, let's say by a quantum computer with 50 qubits mm -hmm. or so, and for no one to be able to explain that in any way other than, well, you know, the, to uh, the, uh, this, this computer involved a quantum state with two to the 50th power amplitudes. And, you know, a classical simulation, at least any that we know today, would require keeping track of two to the 50th numbers. And this is the reason why it was faster. So the intuition is that yeah. then if you demonstrate uh, on 50 qubits, then once you get to 100 qubits, then it'll be even much more faster. Precisely, right. precisely. Yeah, and and you know, and 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 quantum supremacy does not require error correction, right? We don't, you know, we don't have you could say true scalability yet, or true, you know, uh, 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 error correction yet. But you could say quantum supremacy is already enough by itself 
to refute the skeptics who said a quantum computer will never outperform a classical computer for anything. But one, how do you demonstrate quantum yeah. supremacy? And two, what's up with these new news articles I'm reading that Google did so? Yeah, all right, well- uh, What did they great, actually do? Great, great questions, because now you get into uh, uh, actually, you know, a lot of the work that I've, you know, I and my students have been doing for the last decade, which was precisely about uh, uh, how do you demonstrate quantum supremacy using technologies that, you know, we thought would be available in the near future. And so um, one of the main things that uh, we realized in around 2011, and this was um, me and my student, uh, Alex Arkhipov at, at MIT at the time, and uh, independently, uh, some um, um, others, including uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard. Okay, and uh, uh, the, the realization that, that, that we came to was that if you just want to prove that a quantum computer is faster, you know, and not do something useful with it, mm -hmm. then there are huge advantages to sort of switching your attention from problems like factoring numbers that have a single right answer to uh, what we call sampling problems. So these are problems where the goal is just to output a sample from some probability distribution, let's say over strings of 50 bits. Right, so there are you know many, many, many possible valid outputs. You know, your computer will probably never even produce the same output twice. You know, if it's running as as uh, 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 even you know assuming it's running perfectly, okay. But but the key is that some outputs are supposed to be likelier than other ones. So, so sorry to, yeah. to to clarify, is there a set of outputs that are valid and set that are not, or is it it's, more that the distribution mm -hmm. right now now how you how how you do it you know it turns out that with a quantum computer even with the noisy quantum computers that we have now that we have today what you can do is basically just apply a randomly chosen sequence of operations right so we you know we in some of you know we you know that part is almost trivial right we just sort of get the qubits to interact in some random way although a sort of precisely specified random way so we can repeat the exact same random sequence of interactions again and get another sample from that same distribution and what this does is it basically well it creates a lot of garbage but you know very specific garbage right so you know so, uh, of all of the uh so if we're going to talk about google's device there were 53 qubits there okay and so there are two to the 53 power possible outputs mm -hmm. now for some of those outputs you know there are um there was a little bit more destructive interference in their amplitude okay so their amplitudes were a little bit smaller and for others, there was a little more constructive interference. You know, the amplitudes were a little bit more aligned with each other. You know, the, and so those those that were a little bit likelier. Okay, mm -hmm. all of the outputs are exponentially unlikely, but some are, let's say, two times or three times, you know, unlikelier than others. Okay, right. and uh, so so you can define, you know, this sequence of operations that gives rise to this probability distribution. Okay, now um, the next question would be, well, how do you, you know, even if you're sampling from it, how do you verify that? Right, right? How do you, exactly. How do you know? And so um, my students and I, and also the uh, people at Google who are doing the experiment, came up with statistical tests that you can apply. <laughs> with your classical computer okay so it, so it's very expensive oh. <laughs> to do the test on a classical yeah. computer the good news how is big of a number is two to the 50 it's about two. nine quadrillion okay that doesn't help well well you know it's uh, you you <laughs> want no, it I mean, in like scientific notation no no, no, I mean, no. A, what i mean is yeah uh, it is it is it is, is impossible just, to run on a yeah so computer. we will come back yeah. to that it is yeah. just barely possible to run we think on the largest supercomputer that currently exists on earth Correct. which is called summit at oak ridge national lab okay 
<laughs> Great. That's this the, is that's exciting. The, that's the that's the short answer. So so I, I ironically for this type of experiment, we don't want a hundred qubits. Okay, mm -hmm. because with a hundred qubits, even if it works, we don't know how to verify the results. Okay, so we want, you know, a number of qubits that is enough that, you know, the biggest classical computers on earth will have to sweat, you know, and we'll just barely, you know, be able to keep up with, with the quantum computer, you know, using much more time, but they will still be able to do it in order that we can verify the Which results. Which is where the 53 comes from for the right, basically. number Basically, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, that's also, that's sort of, you know, the, the mo I mean, that's 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 sort of where they are now in yeah. terms of scaling you know and then you know soon you know that point will be passed and and then when you get to larger numbers of qubits then you know these these types of sampling experiments will no longer be so interesting because we, we won't even be able to verify the results and we'll have to switch to other types of computation so with it with the sampling thing you know so so the test that google applied with this linear cross entropy benchmark was basically just take the samples that were generated, mm -hmm. which are, you know, a sm very small subset of all the possible samples that there are. But for those, you calculate with your classical computer the probabilities that they should have been output. Mm -hmm. And you see, are those probabilities like larger than the mean? You know, so is the quantum computer biased toward outputting the, the strings that it's, you know, that, that you want it to be biased toward? Okay, and then finally we come to a very crucial question, which is supposing that it does that. Well, how do we know that a classical computer could not have quickly done the same thing, right? How do we know that, you know, this couldn't have been spoofed by a classical computer, right? And so, uh, well, the, the first answer is we don't know for sure. Because you know this takes us into questions of complexity theory, right. you know, uh, you know the, I mean, questions on the of the magnitude of the p versus n p question and things but, like that, right? We, you know, we don't know how to rule out uh, definitively that there could be fast classical algorithms for you know even simulating quantum mechanics and uh, for you know simulating experiments like these, but we can give some evidence against that possibility and that was sort of the you know the main thrust of a lot of the work that my colleagues and I did you know over the last decade which is then sort of in around 2015 or so what led to Google deciding to do this experiment so are, is the kind of evidence you first of all the hard p equals np problem that you mentioned mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. kind of uh, evidence that you're uh were looking at is that something you come to on a sheet of paper or is this something, are these yeah. empirical experiments? It's it's math for the most part. I mean, it, it, you know, it's also, tr tr you, know, you know, we have uh, a bunch of uh, methods that are known for simulating quantum uh, uh, circuits or, you know, quantum computations with classical computers. And so we have to try them all out and make sure that, you know, they don't work, you know, right. make sure that they have exponential scaling on, 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 you know, these problems and, and not just theoretically, but with the actual range of parameters that are actually, you know, uh, uh, arising in Google's experiment. Okay. So, so there is an empirical component to it, right. But now, um, on, uh, on, on the theoretical side, you know, what, basically what we know how to do in theoretical computer science and computational complexity is, you know, we don't know how to prove that most of the problems we care about are hard, but we know how to pass the blame to someone else. Okay, we know <laughs> yeah. how to say, well, look, you know, I can't prove that this problem is hard, but if it is easy, then all these other things that, you know, mm -hmm. You know, for you, you probably were were much more confident, or were, were hard. That th then those would be easy as well. And so we were able to give some reduction evidence for the hardness of simulating these um, um, sampling experiments, these sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments. The reduction evidence is not as satisfactory as it should be. One of the biggest open problems in this area is to make it better. But, you know, we can do something. You know, certainly we can, 
say that you know if there is a fast classical algorithm to spoof these experiments then it has to be very very unlike any of the algorithms that we know same spirit okay so andrew yang mm -hmm. a very intelligent mm -hmm. and uh a presidential candidate with a lot of interesting ideas in all kinds of technological fields tweeted that because of quantum computing no code is uncrackable mm -hmm. is he wrong or right uh, he was uh premature let's say uh so well okay uh, uh wrong <laughs> so look i you know i, I I'm, I'm actually i'm i'm you know I'm, I'm a fan of andrew yang i like his can you know i like his ideas i like his candidacy um i think that uh uh you know he you know he may be ahead of his time with you know the universal basic income and you know and so forth and he may also be ahead of his time in, in that tweet that you referenced so regarding regarding uh using quantum computers to break uh, cryptography so the situation is this yeah. okay so um the famous discovery of peter shore you know 26 years ago <laughs> Of, uh, of of huge numbers and uh, calculate discrete logarithms and uh, solve a few other problems that are very, very special in character, right? They're not NP-complete problems. Mm -hmm. We're pretty sure they're not, okay? But uh, it, it so happens that most of the public key cryptography that we currently use to protect the internet is based on the belief that these problems are hard. Yeah. Okay, what Shore showed is that once you get scalable quantum computers, then that's no longer true. Okay, but now you know, uh, 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 you know, before people panic, there are two important points to understand here. Okay, the first is that uh, quantum supremacy, the milestone that Google just achieved, is very, very far from the kind of scalable quantum computer that would be needed. <laughs> qubits right to threaten cryptography you're talking you know with, with any of the known error correction methods you're talking millions of physical qubits because error and, correction would be required to threaten yes, cryptography yes yes uh, uh, yes yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, 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 it, uh, it certainly would right and uh, uh you know how uh, um how much you know uh, how, how great will the overhead be from the error correction that we don't know yet but uh, with the known codes, you're talking millions of physical qubits and of a much higher quality than any that we have now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that that is, you know, uh, uh, coming soon. Although uh, uh, people who have secrets that you know need to stay secret for 20 years, you know, are already worried about this. You know, for for the good reason that you know we we presume that intelligence agencies are already scooping up data, you know, in the hope that eventually they'll be able to decode it once quantum computers become available. Okay, so so there is so 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 this brings me to the second uh, point I wanted to make, which is that starting to do, and so so you know, um, I'm sure his algorithm is was sort of a dramatic discovery. You know, it could be a big deal for whatever intelligence agency first gets a scalable quantum computer, if no, at least certainly if no one else knows that they have it, right? Uh, but eventually, uh, we think that we could migrate the internet to the post-quantum cryptography, and then we'd be more or less back where we started. Okay, so this is sort of not the application of quantum computing. I think that's really going to change the world in a sustainable way, right? The the big, by the way, the biggest practical application of quantum computing that we know about by far, I think, is simply the simulation of quantum mechanics itself. In order to you know learn about chemical reactions, you know, design maybe new chemical processes, new uh, materials, new drugs, uh, new solar cells, new superconductors, uh, all kinds of things like that. What's the size of a quantum computer that would uh, be able to simulate the you know quantum mechanical systems themselves that would be impactful for the real world mm -hmm. for the kind of uh, 
uh, chemical reactions and that kind of work. What what scale are we talking about? Now, 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 now you're asking a very, very current question, a very big question. P uh, people are going to be racing over the next decade to try to do useful quantum simulations, uh, even with you know 100 or 200 qubit quantum computers of the sort That's that right. we, we expect to be able to build over the next decade. Okay, so that might be you know the first application of quantum computing that we're able to realize you know or or maybe it will prove to be too difficult and maybe even that will require fault tolerance or you know will require error correction so there's uh, an aggressive is, race to come yes. up with the one case study kind of like with yeah. the peter shore the, the, with mm -hmm. the with the idea that would just capture the world's imagination of like, yeah. look, we can actually do something very yeah, useful but I, here. Right, but I think, you know, within the next decade, the best shot we have is certainly not, you know, sh using Shor's algorithm to break cryptography. Uh, uh, you know, it's just, just because it requires, you know, too much in the way of error correction. The best shot we have is to do some quantum simulation that tells the material scientists or chemists or nuclear physicists you know something that is useful to them and that they didn't already know you know and you might only need one or two successes in order to change some you know billion dollar industries right like you know the way that people make fertilizer right now is still based on the haber bosch process from a century ago and it is some many body quantum mechanics problem that no one really understands right if you could design a better way to make fertilizer right that's you know billions of dollars right there so exactly. so so th those are sort of the applications that people are going to be aggressively racing toward over the next decade now i don't know if they're going to realize it or not but you know it is you know there's there's cert they certainly at least have a shot so it's it's going to be a very very interesting next decade. But just to clarify, yeah. what's your intuition? Is if a breakthrough like that comes, would is it possible for that breakthrough to be on fifty to a hundred qubits, or mm -hmm. is scale a fundamental yeah. thing like uh, a five hundred, a thousand plus yeah. qubits? Yeah. So I, I I can tell you what the current studies are say are yeah. saying. Uh, you know, I I, I think. <laughs> of quantum gates okay so they're so basically they're talking about a hundred nearly perfect qubits so the and, logical qubits as you mentioned yeah before. exactly a hundred logical qubits and and now you know the the uh -oh. hard part for the next decade is going to be well what can we do with a hundred to two hundred noisy qubits yeah yeah is there and, error correction breakthroughs that might come mm -hmm. without the need to do uh thousands yeah. or millions of yeah. uh, so, so, physical so, qubits. Yeah, so people are going to be pushing simultaneously on a bunch of different directions. Yeah. One direction, of course, is just making the qubits better, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, there's, there, there is tremendous progress there. I mean, you know, the fidelity is like the, the, the accuracy of the qubits has in, improved by several orders of magnitude, you know, in the, in the, in, um, um, the last decade or two. Okay. The second thing is designing better error, you know, or let's say lower overhead, um, error correcting codes and even short of doing the full recursive error correction, you know, there are these error mitigation strategies that you can use, you know, that may, you know, allow you to eke out uh, a, a useful speed up in, in the near term. And then the third thing is just taking the quantum algorithms for simulating quantum chemistry or materials and making them more efficient. You know, and those algorithms are already dramatically more efficient than they were, let's say, five years ago. And so when, you know, I quoted these estimates like, a, you know, a circuit depth of one million. And so, you know, I hope that because people will care enough that these numbers are going to come down. You put also, uh, you have, you have an amazing blog. You just, you, you put you're a lot, kind. Of, you put a, <laughs> you paid me to say it. <laughs> uh, you put a lot, a lot of effort sort of to communicating the science hmm. of this and communicating, exposing some of the BS and, uh, hmm. 
sort of the the natural, just like in the AI space, the natural charlatanism, if that's a word, mm -hmm. in, in this in quantum mechanics in general, but quantum computers and so on. Mm -hmm. Can you give some notes about people or ideas that people like me or listeners in general from outside the field should be cautious of when they're taking in news headings that Google achieved quantum supremacy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what what should we look out for? Where's the charlatans in the yep. space? Where's the BS? Yeah. So, uh, uh, good question. Uh, 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 unfortunately, quantum computing. Is and so, with with quantum computing, I mean, I, I would say that the main way that people go astray is by you know not focusing on sort of the question of you know are you getting a speed up over a classical computer or not, right? And so, so um, you know, people have like uh, dismissed quantum supremacy because it's not useful, right? Or you know, it's not itself, let's say, obviously useful for anything. Okay, but you know, I, I, ironically, these are some of the same people who will go and say, "Well, oh, well, we care about useful applications. We care about solving traffic routing and optim, you know, and and financial optimization and all these things." And that sounds really good. You know, but their you know their their entire spiel is sort of tr counting on nobody asking the question. Yes, but how well could a classical computer do the same thing? Yeah. This is the Lex Free podcast.